time to come into the house of the Lord and just relax, but not relax too much. Relax in his presence and know that we are entertaining the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Most High God, the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father. Just begin to worship him and lift him up today as we prepare our hearts for the show.
situation you're in, whatever might have happened in your life, you could just call on the name of Jesus. I, I'm sure there's some people that never thought about Jesus lately that's been calling on his name. That's what it's all about. You're drawn to him. You want to be close to him. You just call on the name of Jesus. Whenever, whatever you're in, and God will come to your rescue and be there for you. You just call on his name. We're going to take our knees before the Lord. If you put those up on the, the list up. We also want to remember Sister Janice Dutton is in the hospital in ICU, needs prayer that God would move upon her. Also, Sister Weaver had surgery today. All's going well. It's good to see Brother Donnie White. We want to remember him tonight. God moving his body and continue to heal him. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. But well, let's just take all these needs. Think, look at the list. Think, find a name on there. Pick out a name. I know God, there's a lot of people sick today, a lot of people out. And let's just ask God to move and heal some bodies and strengthen some souls today. All right, Lord, we love you. We thank you today for your blessings. You are a mighty God. You're so wonderful in your great, dear God. Oh, we trust in you, dear Jesus. We call upon your name right now, Lord. We know you're a healer, Lord Jesus. Touch Janice Dutton today, God. Let your spirit touch her today and strengthen her, Lord. Heal her body, dear God. Move that circumstance and situation, Lord Jesus. Move on every one of these needs today. Touch Sister Weaver. Strengthen her, Lord. Let that healing take place in her need today, God. Let her feel your power, Lord Jesus, and your strength, Lord Jesus. We believe you for our Lord. We know you're able today, Lord. Have your perfect way, God. We trust you today, Lord Jesus. Oh, God, have your way in every situation, Lord. Let your healing power move when your name is called, oh God. In every one of their lives, to Jesus, we ask and we praise you for it. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Praise your name. You may be seated. Looking forward to our five minutes of fire tonight from Brother Byron Parker. Looking forward to a great word. Please come and minister to us. situated here. Amen. We got like four pages of notes. But if you can see how big the print was, you know it's still in like oh, maybe three minutes. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. And also when <laughs> I had forgotten it, when you pray, remember a lot of you know uh, Enoch Paul that's here in Anderson and uh, he called me yesterday and he is in the Greenville Hospital with COVID and double pneumonia. So let's remember him when you pray. Lift his name up as well. So, Amen. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. <coughs> Amen. Thank you, Brother Drake, for giving me this opportunity. Amen. And, uh, you know, I wasn't sure about this tonight um, until I heard Brother Drake when he was preaching on Sunday and he mentioned Brother Ron Wright's uh, prophecy that he gave us regarding the great growth of souls. 
in our church over a five-year period, and then I felt like that this would maybe fall in place, and it's uh, something that's been on my heart for a little while now. Amen. So, uh, Sister Amber, if you would put the scriptures up. Very familiar, Acts 2, 37. We're going to start with 37. It says, Now when they, were, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Amen. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as our Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they, then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Amen. So we're going to get back to that in just a little bit. But I guess the title of this message would be, They Won't All Look Like We Do. Amen. They won't all look like we do. Praise the Lord. Now, if you pull up 1 Peter 5, and we're going to talk about 1 Peter 5, 1. The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Amen. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples or examples to the flock. Amen. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Amen. And just, I guess I want to start with a story that I've got a good friend who uh, lives in the Louisiana area, New Orleans area, and she attends a church there, and, and uh, her and her husband attend a church there, and I grew up with her. But uh, I will go ahead and preface this by saying that this was not one, a church in our organization, but it's a smaller, independent church. And she was telling me the story about a lady that attended there, and uh, her daughter, this lady's daughter, came to visit one time, and when she visited, she didn't look like everybody else in the church. She wasn't dressed like everybody else. But guess what this pastor did? When he saw the way she looked, he actually preached about the way she looked. So guess what? This lady never came back to the church. Amen. So that was one soul. We'll get, again, we'll get back to the 3,000 in a minute, but this brings me to the meat of this short message. If, everybody, if everyone in the church looks exactly like we do, are we really doing our job? You hear speakers say this a lot, but I am truly talking to, to me. Amen. I'm speaking to me. But now back to the, th the 3,000. Think about it. If 3,000 new converts, 3,000 souls, new converts were added to SOP, to the sanctuary of praise in one day, I wonder what other apostolics would think that didn't attend our church if they came and visited. What would they think? Again, 3,000 new converts. Would they, say, would they say that we've gone charismatic? Okay, because these were 3,000 brand new people. Amen. When this prophecy from Brother Ron Wright comes to pass, I'm going to say it that way, we're going to have people that don't look exactly like us. They don't smell like us. They don't talk like us. Amen. Let's be examples to the flock. Let's let God do the work and let our pastor lead and teach in wisdom, which he does. Amen. How many appreciate your pastor tonight? Amen. And, and please understand that this is not a lesson on standards. It's nothing. This has, that, that is not the case at all. Amen. But understand that when God gives the increase, they won't all look like we do at the beginning. But let's be examples to the flock. Amen. Amen. You know, I was thinking about this example, Brother Travis. You know, we go to the gym. And I was thinking, you know, a couple years ago, I started going to the, trying to go to the gym to work out. When I get there and, and when I first started, I look at all the guys and I see all the guys there, and I don't look nothing like those guys that had the big muscles and everything. But then, two years later, Brother White, after I've been working out for two years, I go back, and I get in amongst these guys, and I look at them, and I still don't look like the guys that have been working out. Okay? <laughs> Amen. But my whole point to that is that it's a process. It takes time, but you're going to strive to keep doing it. Amen? you got to get there. Praise the Lord. Amen. And 
And, uh, you know, when I talked to Sister Kim Labrie, um, I called her, and she gave me permission uh, but to use her as an example. But what a soldier of Christ this lady is. Amen. I love you, sister. And, you know, we were talking about this, and when she first, when she first got into the church, she just wanted to put on the garment of Christ. That's what she wanted to do. She wanted to do whatever she could to be pleasing to God. But the change as far as the way she looked, maybe, and talked and everything, that didn't happen immediately, did it, sis? Amen. But guess what? No one had to get in her ear. No one had to say anything. She saw examples to the flock, like we were talking about a while ago. Amen. Godly examples. And I was thinking of people like Sister Baldwin and even Sister Shaw and some of these examples that all she had to do was just see. Amen. But she also put on the garment of Christ. That was her words. Amen. And, and, and just uh, no one, again, had to tell her anything. But look at where she's at today. Amen. Praise the Lord. We are living in exciting times. And be encouraged when thinking about this. How exciting is it going to be when we have a congregation full of people coming in that don't look like us, they don't smell like us, they don't talk like us. Again, through examples to the flock and through preaching and teaching from our pastor, God will change hearts and minds and all the things that go along with growing. Amen. And I'll end with this, Psalms 86, 15. I just thought this was a neat scripture. But it says, uh, But thou, O Lord, are a, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. I'm so thankful for a God that is long-suffering, merciful, gracious, and full of compassion. How about you? Are you thankful today? Amen. Amen. Let's continue to worship the Lord. Hallelujah.
lift your voice and sing it. given tonight. Brother Byron Crocker did a tremendous job. Amen. What a truth. What a truth we heard. What a truth. And um, help us to not just say amen, but take that store in our hearts. Live it. Amen. It comes in time. Let's just win the soul. After the soul's won, we got to start discipling. Amen. But I'm so thankful. God gives us grace. Amen. Appreciate that. I know what kind of time was spent putting that together, and I appreciate that very much. Amen. Let me run through these announcements real quick. Parents and youth, be on the lookout for information coming regarding Pulse this Friday night. And Brother, Sister Wiseman, uh, Hannah Kelton, not able to be here tonight. They're hoping to be okay by Friday. And uh, we'll get information out about that. But, so just be on the lookout for announcements on that. Also, the money for youth convention registration is due tonight, okay? It's 55 for registration, 10 additional if you want a shirt. And you can see Sister Debbie Wiseman to pay that after service. Again, um, if there's any anybody, I want our kids to go, and I will pay for them personally if I have to. Um, if that's an issue, please talk with me. I want to be sure they go to this youth convention. Shepherd's Pantry is Saturday, January the 22nd. Please make plans to help that Friday night for preparation, and then Saturday, if you can, um, there's always something to do. And sometimes if you come and you're elbow to elbow and you're thinking they don't need me, well, the next month, guess what? There's like two of us doing everything. <laughs> so it's important. It's better if you just come and then we can just leave earlier um, because sometimes everybody leaves and we're still cleaning up. And I'm like, where'd y'all go? I got another hour here. <laughs> so it's important if you can help to please help. And um, there's something for us all to do. There will be a married couple's Valentine banquet February the 12th at 6 p.m. in the fellowship hall. There will be a special speaker, and the meal will be catered. Couples will need to sign up and pay by February the 6th. Please see Sister Miller for more information on that. And again, thank you for taking those Christmas for Christ pledges. They are due by the 31st. If you're paying by Giblify, we need it by the 30th. So it shows on that report um, for that week, okay? There's still a few envelopes to my left if you want to grab one. Lastly, there's three things that I need done. Um, I ran out of time this week. I have a district board meetings tomorrow and Friday. We'll be home Saturday. And I ran out of time to do them. Um, so if you can do one of these projects, please see me after service, and I will point you in the right direction. There is a toilet upstairs in a room that we're trying to re reorganize and, and remodel um, for our Sunday school department that's got a toilet. So if you need a toilet in your house, I got one for you. I'll make you a deal. Really, I need somebody to pull it up. I can pull the toilet up. What I can't do is fix what's underneath it. So I need somebody with knowledge to look at it and tell us what to do, and I need you to volunteer to do it, okay? So if you can help us with that, because we need to, like, redo everything. So we've got a toilet situation. Um, the baptistry needs cleaning. Uh, it was my intention to do this yesterday, and time was not on my side. Um, it needs to be drained, cleaned, refilled. 
I can tell you all the info on that if you can help us. And lastly, there's some stuff in the gym that's been there, and we have got to get it hauled off, preferably this week. If you have a truck and can haul that off, it can go to Goodwill to the dump. The choice is up to you. I need, I need somebody that can volunteer to haul that off. So if there's three things I need to have done. If you could see me about that, I will point you in the right direction. Amen. Mark chapter 7, verse 13. Yes, I know they're forecasting ice and snow. I'm surprised everybody's texting me and saying, we're having church Sunday. It ain't snowed yet. I plan to have church. If that changes, we'll let you know, but just plan to be in church. If your road is undrivable and you wouldn't drive to work or to the store, then don't drive to church. But don't miss church and go to Walmart. Amen. Don't miss church. Well, I'm about to really get in trouble. Don't miss church and then go eat at Red Lobster. Because the roads were too unsafe. Now, can I also say this without you throwing stones at me? Everybody who said I was so unspiritual for not having church for several weeks because of safety due to COVID, do you feel that same way about ice? I was not spiritual when we took eight weeks off because of COVID because I wanted to be safe. And y'all said, don't be safe, have faith. Well, I want to see you on faith driving on ice on Sunday, coming to the house of the Lord on faith because you're spiritual, right? Now, I'm being funny, but there's a little seriousness there. That's why grace is always necessary, right? Y'all ready to go home yet? <laughs> Mark chapter 7, verse 13. This is coming right in the middle of teaching Jesus is doing. Really good talk he's given. And he says to these Pharisees, you're making the word of God of none effect. Through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. Let me read this to you in two other versions, okay? Let me read it to you in the contemporary English. And you ignore God's commands in order to follow your own teaching. You do a lot of other things that are just as bad. New Living Translation. And so, here it is, you cancel the Word of God. You cancel the Word of God in order to hand down your own tradition. And this is only one example among many others. There's a little buzz phrase going around in our politically tense landscape. It's called cancel culture. Cancel culture. So I'm going to talk tonight about the dangers of cancel culture. The dangers of cancel culture. Now, I'll say this. We'll pray and be seated. I'm not going where you think I'm going. I'm not touching anything politically tonight. Pulpit's not a place for that. Neither is it in the mouth of saints of God. But anyway. But. It causes too much division. Let's just talk about the Word of God and be unified. And that's another message for another time. <laughs> but here's the thing about canceling. I can cancel something I subscribe to. But I can't cancel what I had nothing to do with. There's danger in cancel culture. Jesus, I thank you for your presence tonight. Your word that's already went forth, I thank you for the reading of your word. I pray you talk to the hearts of your people, your church. And I pray you draw us very close to your presence and your will. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. Lord bless you and you may be seated. Thank you for standing. The dangers of cancel culture. Wasn't there such a sweet undertone of worship they kept trying to break loose in here? I really feel like God's wanting to speak to us tonight. I want you to look at Mark 7 again. We're going to kind of walk through this a couple of verses at a time. Verse number 1 here of Mark 7 of our text chapter, Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say with unwashing hands, they found fault. Okay? Now, when we hear the word Pharisee, we cringe because Pharisees got a bad rap. They are labeled as being holier than thou. They are labeled as being hypocrites as they want to command others to do things that they themselves have no intention 
of doing. Now, this reputation was developed because of their actions. However, it's not how they were originally meant to be received. A Pharisee, by definition, is not a bad thing. A Pharisee, by definition, is a separatist. Someone who is exclusively religious. In all honesty, that's what we as Christians are called to be. Separatist and exclusively religious. Sometimes religion gets a bad word. It's just following Christ and a belief system. The most important lesson we can learn from the Pharisees is not to allow our actions to taint our good name. Christians ought to be the most loving, most respectful, most honest, and the most dependable people in society. Their reputation ought to precede them for the good and not for the bad. Now, unfortunately, for a number of reasons, that's not the case. Regardless of what our title is, we are known by our actions. I'll never forget, I'll pick on myself tonight, I'll never forget I was around 18, 19 years old. I was working for a large manufacturing company here in town. My time as a temporary employee had come to an end, and I was hired on with the company. The department that I had been training in was starting a third shift, and I was happy because they had stuck me on second shift. And this this new shift was being staffed with mostly brand new employees. And so the supervisor came to me and said, you have the most experience in this department on this shift you're going to, and so you are going to be the team leader. Now, for starters, I, I am the youngest person on the team, And in some cases, it's nearly 40 years or better. Not only that, but um, on third shift, there are very few people on the top end of the supervision role on site. And so the buck was having to stop with this young buck. It, It made some interesting times. I was responsible for our shift making certain numbers in production. And so there were times that I had to jump in and take control of the situation. Now I was young, I was young in the workforce, and I was also young in the Lord. What a dangerous, deadly combination. And so because of all that, I, I did not always deal with people in the right way. There were some things that I did wrong, and there were some people that I did wrong. And of course, at the same time, I'm trying to be mindful of my Christian duties, and so I am witnessing as I go. Well, there was this time that things on the, on, in the department on the shift had really come to a head, and one of the folks working for me was airing out all of their grievances, and they were doing it in front of everyone, and all of a sudden they cut their eyes to me and said this, Ain't that right, preacher, preacher? Embarrassed is not the word. Cut me deep. Not so much on being called out in front of everyone, but facing the sad reality that I had been a hypocrite and had tarnished my witness. However, it's moments like this in which we learn how to do better and to be better. I kind of learned from that experience how to talk to people and how to treat people and how to interact on the job and how to lead a team. It helped me to mature really quick. And I cannot stand up here and tell you that I had it all figured out or even now that I've got it all figured out. But this I know desperately. I want people to see Christ in me. I want to live up to my name As a Christian, because that means that Christ is alive and at work in me, and that's very valuable in this day and age. Amen. I don't want to be a Christian in name only. I want my name to speak for me. 
These Pharisees had the right definition but not the right reputation. They saw some of Jesus' disciples eating bread with the file, that is to say with unwashing hands, and immediately they found fault. Let's focus on that for a moment. How easy is it for us to find fault in others? It's so easy that we often overlook our own faults to point out the faults in others. Amen. You don't believe me? Have more than one child in your home. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's so easy. It's so easy. And we were, you know, here's what happens. Here's what happens when we overlook our own faults. We're in Walmart. And we see brother or sister so-and-so. And we see them and we know they see us. And they just barely speak in passing. I mean... They did not stop in the middle of the aisle and say, Oh, brother so-and-so, may the Lord bless and keep you. It was on my to-do list today to be sure I saw you in public. How are you doing? How is your family? I am so happy right now to see you. And when that does not happen, <laughs> Some Christian. Uh-huh. How about this one? They knew that I was moving this week. And they did not offer to help me. Some preacher he is. They got a pickup truck. Brother Black. Brother Dylan. And you didn't bother offering. You didn't rent a U-Haul with your own money and come to my house and help me move. Y'all want some more? How about this one? I wasn't invited. They're supposed to be saved. And they didn't invite me. Let's put it on a church level. Walked right by me. Didn't speak. Didn't even look my way. Some church this is. Folks, I hope you feel silly right now. Because I've just spoke a whole lot of truth in a few sentences. Can I ask you this question? Can you be honest with me? Has anybody ever had a bad day? I got a few honest people and the rest are liars. Let's try it again. Has any, some of you are having a bad day right now because you ain't smiled one time tonight. You ever had a bad day? Raise your hand. Come on, get it up. Look around, folks. Look around. That's everybody. Look around. You ever had a bad week? Have you ever had a bad month? My goodness, we look behind our shoulders. Ever had a bad year? Two years? Do I hear three? Going once, twice? Sometimes when you're in Walmart, you just want to shop and go home. Sometimes, I'm sorry, but there's sometimes I cannot physically help you move. I, I couldn't afford to feed everyone. And I sure didn't have room in my home to invite everyone. And sometimes in church, I'm just barely hanging on by a thread. And I can't even find it in my heart to speak to Jesus. Before we look to find fault, let's seek to find some understanding. Now, should we be happy to see each other? Yes. Should we help each other move? Yes. Should we seek to invite and include everyone? Yes. Should we speak to everyone on the church property? Yes. Do we all always do these things? No. Even those of us who bury others in stones for not doing these things, nine times out of ten, we don't do them either. Amen. 
So don't be so quick to find fault. These Pharisees saw Jesus eating without washing their hands. His disciples. Now for us, we're southerners. This is nasty, right? Uh Uh-huh. But it wasn't even a health concern for the Pharisees. Look at verse 3 to see what it really was all about. We're still in Mark 7. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not, and many other things there be, which they have received to hold as the washing of cups and pots and brazen vessels and of tables. Not because of health and cleanliness, but because of the traditions of the elders. Verse 5. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said unto them, Well hath the Sias prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Now that took a drastic turn. What's he talking about? We're just talking about a tradition of hand washing, right? But Jesus saw the heart of the issue at hand, and he dug deep, and he questioned their heart. Verse 7, how be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. In other words, for no purpose they worship me, because they teach the commandments of men as doctrines. They've crossed the line. And see, this is how the Pharisees went astray, and the meaning of their name began to be what it was because they allowed the commandments of men to be placed at a higher priority than those of God. Verse 8 says, For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things you do. And he said unto them, Full well you reject the commandment of God that you may, you may keep your own tradition. Now, I do want to point out here that the issue at hand is not necessarily traditions. If we're not careful, we ride that horse a lot. It's just tradition, and we just throw it away. Paul talked about keeping traditions. The issue is rejecting the commandment of God so that you may keep your tradition. The tradition of washing your hands before you eat and washing pots and cups is certainly not a bad thing. Wouldn't you agree? I mean... There's been a few times lately, I think I've washed dishes four and five times a day. Sink's full, right? It's probably not a bad thing to wash those dishes, right? However, the issue is when you find fault in those who are not keeping it as you are, and you call their character and walk with God into question for it. Jesus continues to peel this back, exposing the layers of hypocrisy. Verse 10, For Moses said, Honor thy father, and thy mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. Straightforward command in the word of God is honor thy father and mother that thy days may be long on the earth. God wrote it with his own hand. But look how the Pharisees twisted it up. Look at, now this is, this is where we're getting to the meat here, okay? We just had the appetizer so far. Here's the meat. Verse 11. But ye say if a man shall say to his father or mother, it's Corbin. That is to say, a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And you suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother. Now let me explain this. We are commanded by God to honor our parents all of the days. But the Pharisees were teaching that it's only a bonus if you honor them. But you don't have to catch that? God said do it. The Pharisees said no, only if you want to. It's a bonus for them. They may have become more popular with the crowd by establishing things like this, but look how Jesus viewed it in verse 13. In doing this, he said, you make the word of God of none effect through your tradition which you have delivered, and many such like things do ye. The bottom line is they thought that their tradition was going to strengthen the word of God by offering liberty to its followers, but instead it weakened it. 
They weakened it because the followers of these teachings of the Pharisees thought they would still get the blessing of God, but it was impossible because the commandment had been compromised. Sure, it gave them more free time because they didn't have to consider checking on their parents or helping them with any needs that they had. Gave them free time. And most likely now, after being under Jewish culture and teaching and belief to serve and honor, respect and love, now that they were released from that by these spiritual leaders, all of a sudden, liberty, right? Freedom. A weight off of my shoulders. Freedom. However, let's talk reality here with parents and children. One day, when their parents are gone, they're sure, they, they will sure wish they didn't feel that way. How about this? You ever seen this happen with a parent and a child relationship? When someone else steps in and fills their shoes and develops that relationship with their parents in their place, all of a sudden now they feel like they're missing out and someone's done them wrong. But they walked away a long time ago. In the end, it could have all been avoided just by following the command of God as it was written. Jesus had to go on in the chapter and dig a little deeper and straighten things out. He when he did, he circled back around to the original fault they found, eating with unwashed hands, verses 14 through 16. And when he had called all the people unto him, he said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand. There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. If any man have ears, let him hear. He is speaking in a parable right here. But as the disciples inquired to know more, he broke it down a little further. Verse 18, And he saith unto them, Are you so without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatsoever thing from without enter into the man, it cannot defile him, because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out into the drought, purging all meats? And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. The truth that we have to learn here is that if everything that came in defiled us, we could not even walk outside of our homes. Even in our homes, we couldn't read anything, listen to anything, and don't dare surf the web. But we have a filter of conscience and the Holy Ghost to push these things through and to purge them out. However, what we have to guard is what is within. Okay, It is initiated by what comes in. And that's why it's so important that we monitor what we allow in intentionally. Okay? You can't help walking down the grocery store aisle. Okay? Let me give you a practical example. It's the New Year's, right? And everybody's on a diet. I'm a weekend today. Already lost some weight. You can't tell. I can tell. Thanks for saying it. And uh, I had to go to the grocery store before I came here. And I walked down the aisles. But my app said I couldn't have it, so I put it on back. But boy, it was tempting me when I walked by. But guess what? If I do not intentionally let it in my cart, it will not intentionally make it into my belly. And then intentionally make me fat. But guess who controls letting it in? Now, just because I walked down the aisle where it was, it didn't defile me sitting on that shelf. It defiled me when I looked, couldn't quit looking, took a hold of it, said bloop, and then said bloop. And then it happened. You can't walk around with blinders, folks. We're called to live in a world and not of it. You can't hide yourself from the realities of evil. But you can control. When you're exposed, what you do with the content. You can control that. What we dwell upon matters. 
Proverbs 23 and 7 says this. First part, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Whatever you think on, you will be. Not just necessarily whatever you see, but what you think on. Okay? That's why the Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippian church in Philippians 4 and 8 and said, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. You know what he was saying? He was saying, be intentional about what you think upon. Everything you're exposed to won't hurt you, but what you dwell upon just might. Be careful. Be careful. And let me say you this. I know we've kind of done a hodgepodge, but it's all been in the same chapter of teaching by Jesus. But let me, let me, let me say this to us today. We're called to live in the world, not of it. We've got to be exposed to all these things, but we've got to learn not to take it in and become like it, Right? Be careful not to be influenced by culture. Be careful not to be influenced by culture. Now, holiness is not homely. Holiness is not letting yourself go. And if you're saying holiness is ugly, you don't believe the Bible. The Bible says there is beauty. In holiness. Okay? Culture wants us to think it's not enough. We're not doing enough. We're not good enough. Do not be influenced by culture. It's okay to be stylish. Just don't blur the lines and get caught up in the world. Pastor Doug White said it this way. Don't call it holiness if it's not separated from the world. There should always be a noticeable distinction between the people of God and the world. Always. Okay? That, that's a good test. Well, as an apostolic, is there any distinction in me from the current culture? If the answer is no, there's probably no holiness involved. And so if you see me, and I look, I believe a thousand percent everything that man said tonight. I'm teaching the church tonight, okay? There's a growth process. I care what they look like. How they smell, how they act, what they identify as. They're welcome in this church. But that does not negate the fact that they are commands in this book, not a UPC manual, but they are commands in this book that tells us how to live, okay? And so there is always going to be a growth process. And when we get to heaven, there's going to be people, let's say there's 10 levels, people at 10 all the way to 1, they're going to make it in, okay? They're all going to make it in. The 10 not accountable for the 1 except for how they lived in front of them, but the 10 should know what's in this book and be living by it. And in spiritual discipleship, you don't arrive day one, but you grow as you go. So how do I know, how do I gauge my spiritual health? Have you grown any? Have you changed any? Have you gotten closer to God or have you regressed and gotten further from Him? Have you lined up more so with this or have you lined up more so with GQ? And G, whatever it is, I don't know what it is. GQ, Chewy, I don't know. What, Topo Chico, I don't know. Whatever's out there today, what do you identify with? Okay? Now, here's where we tie in the title and where we're at. I know people will say, ah, it's okay. Can I give you a revelation? not okay obey the commandment of God not the tradition of men oh it's 
I mean, seriously, Brother Baldwin, these, these spiritual men that, that when they walked in, oh, rabbi, rabbi, big, long, pretty, whatever, dumping all the money in the treasury. Those men that are supposed to, that walked around with the scribes, the one who copied the word down, they should know that thing. But they looked at a generation, they looked at an emerging new age generation of their day that was struggling with the command of honoring mother and father. Not what you watch, where you party, what you wear. No, a generation struggling with honoring mom and dad. And instead of standing on God's word, well, go ahead and disobey them. I mean, in those days, they'd stone you to death, right? They decided they didn't want any blood on their hands that way, so they just said, oh, you know, it's okay. Tell you what, just, just join my temple. Bring me your chicken eggs. Bring me your chicken eggs. Bring, bring me some grain. It's just a blessing if you honor them. It's okay not to. Preachers looked at the Word of God and said to somebody in the congregation, it's okay not to do that. Negating God's command, stripping from their lives God's blessing. That's the cancel culture I'm talking about. We live in a generation right now in a heightened spiritual age that is looking to cancel the commands of God's word. There's dangers in cancel culture. And look, I, I get it. Tear this down. Rename this. Whatever. I had nothing to do with any of it. Okay? That's the cancel culture of our day. You know what we can't control? Folks, we know who has saved us. We know who has brought us here. Why would I go back and erase anything that he's done for me? Why would I go back and erase anything that represents what he brought me from and what I've grown into? Why would I cancel anything? Why would I go back and say, well, 10 years ago when I developed that conviction, it doesn't matter and now look, I'm talking to some of you teenagers. I'm talking about honoring your mom and dad. Some of you older folks, you don't talk to your mom and dad to get on your phone. Do right. That's in there like Deuteronomy 22 and 5 is in there. Pay any ties? Guess what? That's in there. Like thou shalt not murder's in there. We don't need to be, I'm reading Jeremiah right now, and they got that, they didn't like what he said. They didn't like the scroll that he wrote. That old wicked king took his pen knife and just cut it up. Threw it away in the fire. We live in that kind of generation. But Jesus said, don't cancel it. Just obey it. The reality is we can't cancel it. We can't change it. We can't take it away. You know why? It's not our word. We didn't write it. We didn't settle it in heaven. And unfortunately, as much as I want to be sometimes, I'm not God. Amen? The dangers of cancel culture. I want to lift our voices unto the Lord right now and just pray. And ask the Lord He would help us tonight. Jesus, we love you. God, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your mercy. I pray, God, every spirit of cancellation that's wanting to get inside of us right now. God, of love to you, love to your word, love to your church, love to one another, love to a lost and a broken world. I'm asking you, Lord, right now, let us have a revelation. God, wake us up with dreams. 
I pray, God, you'd give us dreams. I pray you'd give us vision, Lord. I pray you'd bring us conviction until, like the prodigal son, we come to ourselves, God, and we align ourselves back with the Father's house, back with your word. I pray as the church of the living God, as your people, Lord, I pray let this spirit to stand and walk with you, God, and to be a separatist, God, unto you, Lord Jesus. I'm asking you, Lord, to do a work in our hearts. I'm asking you, God, to draw us close to you, to stay close to you, Lord. Pray, God, you would keep us. You know what God's doing? He looked down that day. Jesus talks about it. He looked down that day, that Pharisee, he was, boy, he emptied the savings. He emptied the savings and he poured it, Brother White, all into that treasury. And his garments on Boy, he looked good. Good holy saint, man of God, just pouring that money in. Look at me. Here's your example. Here I am. But on the other side stood a man who had nothing to throw in that day. Didn't even feel worthy to be there because he could not even as much. So Chantal was lift up his eyes. He slowed his breast. God, have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. You know where God had mercy? God looked at that man that had nothing seemingly at all. God looked at that man who didn't have it together, but he stood there humbly in his presence. Hey folks, there's no reason to quit. There's no reason to throw in the towel. Just tell God I'm not worthy, but I'm here. Would you help me? He'll take you by the hand. He'll take you where you need to go. It's time we listen to God. Shut out every voice and let God lead us. Anybody believe that tonight? Let's give God praise together. Lord, we love you. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give him worship. We praise your holy name. Thank you tonight for your goodness, Lord. God, there is none like you in all the earth. I bless you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your people. Thank you, God, for your church, Lord. Draw us close to you, to live for you and serve you all of our days. We love you, Lord, and give you honor. In Jesus' precious name. Somebody said amen. Amen. Lord, bless you. You are dismissed in the fear of the Lord. Thank you for being here tonight. We love you.